911. What's the address of your emergency? Tell me exactly what happened. I think I killed my. What What do you mean by that? What happened? I had a dream, and then I turn on the lights, and she's dead on the floor. How? How? I'm, I'm I have blood all over me, and there's a bloody knife on the bed, and I think I did it. Matthew and Lauren Phelps were married less than a year, and at first they seemed like a match made in heaven. After all, he was an aspiring preacher and she was a devoted Sunday school teacher. But lurking beneath the happy newlywed facade was a dark secret. It started as an ordinary evening in Raleigh, North Carolina, but that all changed when Matthew made a bone-chilling call to 911. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. When did when did you wake up to find this? Well, I don't need to know what time it is. All right, stay on the phone with me, sir. I just gotta ask you a few questions, okay? I'm getting some help to you. Are you with Are you with the patient now? Yeah, I can see her. Okay. All right. How old is the How old is the patient? She's 29. Okay. Is she Is she awake at all right now? What makes you think she's dead? Is she awake? She's not breathing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, do you think she is beyond, beyond any help? I don't know. I don't, I'm too scared to get too close to her. Okay, just stay on the phone with me, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. Paramedics rushed to the couple's home and encountered a gruesome scene beyond their worst nightmares. It wasn't just that Lauren had been violently murdered in her own bedroom, but that the person sleeping next to her claimed to have no recollection of the night's events. Still, Matthew had an explanation for his missing memory, and it's one that shocked even the most seasoned detectives. 28-year-old Matthew Phelps and 29-year-old Lauren Hugelmeyer first met during their time together in a Kentucky middle school and bonded over a shared love for Star Wars. The pair lost touch for a while, but eventually reconnected. They started dating and were later married in November 2016. Matthew then moved into Lauren's quaint rally townhouse to begin their married life. Scrolling through their social media feeds, the church-going couple appeared happy and very much in love. Lauren worked as an auditor, a Sunday school teacher, and a Cincy salesperson. At the same time, Matthew was employed at a lawn care business and studying to become a pastor. Life was good, but all was not as it seemed to be. Well, that was until September 1st, 2017. Hi, I'm Lauren, your Sensi Independent Consultant. Thank you so much for joining me for this Facebook party. I just want to show you an inside scoop about what my favorite Sensi things are. It has been a blessing to my life. For real, because I've met so many amazing, talented, inspiring women in the few months that I've been doing Sensi, and I cannot be more grateful for the opportunity that Sensi has given me. Just 10 hours after Lauren posted an upbeat video to social media highlighting a new Sensi product, Matthew made that harrowing call to 911. He explained to the dispatcher that he had just woken up from a dream to find himself covered in blood, with his wife lying in the fetal position on the bedroom floor. Paramedics rushed Lauren to a nearby hospital, where she was confirmed dead on arrival. An autopsy report later told a terrifying story of what happened that night. The medical examiner found that she had suffered 123 distinct stab wounds and cuts, some up to four inches deep, to her head, neck, abdomen, and arms. In addition, she had countless defense wounds and hair, later determined to be Matthews, clutched in one of her hands. Therefore, the medical examiner listed her official cause of death as homicide by multiple sharp forced injuries. Meanwhile, Matthew, who police found emotionless at the scene, was apprehended and brought to the station for questioning. Investigators honed in on the fact that during the 911 call, Matthew seemed to be blaming his actions on something truly bizarre. When did you, when did you wake up? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I took I took more medicine than I should have. What medicine did you take? I took I took horse eating, cough and cold because I know it can make you feel good. So a lot of times I can't sleep at night. All right, so. What is it? What are you sure she's not breathing? She's not moving. Oh my God. Yes, you heard right. He claimed to have accidentally killed his wife in a hallucinatory state after ingesting an excess of coarse cough and cold, an over the counter medication. 
Now, this is where things really start to go off the rails. Bayer, the manufacturer of Coracidin, quickly reacted and released a statement expressing condolences to the family. They also remarked there is no evidence to suggest that Coracidin is associated with violent behavior. Still, detectives located an empty package of Coracidin at the crime scene, but not everything about Matthew's story was adding up. The crime scene seemed staged, with the murder weapon and medicine neatly placed where they would be visible to authorities. It also appeared that Matthew had attempted to clean himself up before paramedics arrived, as there wasn't nearly as much blood on him as would be expected. Still, Matthew insisted that the cold medicine made him kill his wife. Then, four days after Lauren's death, Matthew appeared in court for the first time, facing a first-degree murder charge. He entered the room and kept his head low to avoid eye contact with Lauren's loved ones, as the judge explained the potential consequences of his actions. Shortly after, a medical report was released stating that Matthew didn't have enough coracidin in his system at the time to impact his reasoning, but he still didn't change his story. When Matthew's trial date finally arrived, prosecutors emphasized to the court that the attack on Lauren was both intentional and premeditated. They showed his search history leading up to the murder, which included questions like, how loopy does coracidin make you? And, have other people been high from coracidin? Adding even more fuel to the fire, investigators had conducted a luminal test at the house, which proved their suspicions that Matthew had tried to clean up the scene. Matthew's defense was basically grasping at straws and merely pointed to their client's seemingly harmless nature as the reason he should be found innocent. In reality, Michael's attorney was arguing a defense called a diminished capacity. With a diminished capacity defense, any incapacitating factor, including voluntary intoxication, can be considered when evaluating a defendant's state of mind. Essentially, he is arguing that Matthew's mental condition was so diminished that he could not form the intent required to commit the crime. However, the fact that Matthew had made some suspicious internet searches cuts against this defense. On October 5th, 2018, Matthew accepted a plea deal to avoid the death penalty and pled guilty to first-degree murder. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Following the sentencing, Matthew apologized to Lauren's loved ones. So, how did Matthew and Lauren go from marital bliss to murder in less than one year? Well, for starters, there were some financial difficulties. While Lauren had been rather thrifty in her spending, Matthew was known to blow large sums. I'm talking more money than he earned on iTunes and video games, forcing Lauren to pick up extra work. Things between them got so bad that Lauren actually confided in friends and family that she was thinking about leaving him just a short time after their wedding. Still, Matthew seemed like the perfect husband to those on the outside. But unbeknownst to everyone, he was hiding a darkness that had followed him since childhood. Matthew reportedly struggled with depression most of his life. He later became addicted to video games and frequently abused cold medicine. Oh, and he was so obsessed with the 2000 horror film American Psycho that he made a secret Instagram account under at Marty underscore Radical to share photos of himself dressed as the movie's killer. Matthew's apparent hero worship of a movie serial killer should send alarm bells ringing. Idolizing Patrick Bateman and dressing up like his character is a sign that Matthew may have been fantasizing about what it would have been like to actually be him. He also shared personal posts on other platforms with one reading, Ever since I was little, I've had some strong activity in my dreams. Nightmares, night terrors, sleepwalking, hallucinations, and controlled dreams have filled my life so far. It later came out that Matthew had previously been married and was allegedly violent with his ex-wife, who testified against him in court. Moreover, Lauren's friends told investigators that Matthew had something of an inappropriate relationship with one of their neighbors. So yeah, there were some definite warning signs of trouble in paradise. Lauren's heartbroken sister released a statement to the media saying, He seemed to love Lauren in spite of any flaw she could have and would do anything to make her happy. What we didn't know is that he was playing a game, a very deadly game. He was luring all of us into a trap by taking advantage of our kindness and generosity. We never once thought Lauren was in danger. Unfortunately, abusers are very good at hiding the truth from everyone who knows them. They are excellent actors and can play the role of doting partner in front of other people. It can be very difficult and often impossible for family members or friends to recognize that their loved one is in an abusive relationship. It's sometimes even difficult for the person involved in the relationship to recognize it as abuse. The abusive partner can be sweet and charming one day, but cruel the next, often leaving the victim confused or even blaming themselves. Here are some warning signs that someone may be an abuser. 
Aggressive behavior in previous relationships is a huge red flag that more violence will occur in future relationships. Frequently overspending on non-essential items when that money is needed for both partners' basic needs can be a sign of financial abuse. Blowing large sums of money and leaving Lauren to pick up more work like Matthew did shows not only irresponsibility, but a lack of respect. How to leave an abusive relationship Leaving an abuser can be one of the most dangerous times. Reach out to a professional for help on safely leaving an abusive situation. They can help you come up with a plan. Now, let's move on from that tragic tale to another insane true crime story, shall we? What you just saw is the last known footage of Sandra Cantu, an eight-year-old little girl who disappeared from a close-knit California community. Little did anyone know that suspicion would soon fall on the most far-fetched of suspects. Sandra Renee Cantu was born on March 8, 2001 in Tracy, California, where she lived in a mobile home with her mother, Maria Chavez, grandparents, and three older siblings. March 27, 2009 was just like any other day, with Sandra returning home from school at around four in the afternoon. She happily skipped down the road to her friend's house to play, but when she didn't return in time for dinner, her mother instinctively knew something was terribly wrong. Maria scoured the neighborhood looking for her daughter, even going door to door, but no one had seen Sandra, so she contacted the police and reported her child missing. Authorities arrived at Maria's home, gathered a few details about Sandra, such as the clothes she was last seen wearing, a Hello Kitty shirt, and black leggings. Officers immediately started canvassing the area in hopes of finding Sandra, but they got the same results as Sandra's mother. Meanwhile, Maria received a text from one of her neighbors, a local Sunday school teacher named Melissa Huckabee, reading, Tell the police that I had something stolen today around 4 p.m. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. No one could have ever imagined the impact this message would later have on the case. So with a potential robbery on the same day, police intensified the search for Sandra and called in the FBI. They also utilized helicopters, divers, cadaver dogs, and hundreds of volunteers. In addition, the FBI and Trace Crime Stoppers posted a $2,000 reward for her safe return, which quickly grew to $30,000 thanks to generous donations as Sandra's disappearance appeared all over the media. Detectives turned their attention to a few shifty characters known around town, including a strange man driving an ice cream truck in the neighborhood on the same day Sandra went missing. At first, it seemed like a good lead, but he was quickly ruled out. Detectives were made aware of another man who lived near Sandra and had been seen giving her an inappropriate kiss two years earlier. While he was undoubtedly sketchy, he was also ruled out in the young girl's disappearance. Then a potential break came in the case when searchers uncovered a Hello Kitty shirt at the local dump. Unfortunately, Maria confirmed that it was not the same size or color as the one Sandra had been wearing. It was starting to feel like every lead they got was a dead end. But then, something truly bizarre happened during a candlelight vigil for Sandra. Roughly 6,000 people gathered to show their support for Sandra's family, including the police. However, the prayers were interrupted when a woman ran over to the police, very agitated, crying, hyperventilating, and holding a letter she claimed to have found on the ground reading, Cantu locked in stolen suitcase, thrown in water on Bacchetti Road and Whitehall Road, witness. The woman calmed down and told the police that her suitcase had gone missing from her driveway the same day Sandra had vanished. Now, if you haven't already connected the dots, this woman was 28-year-old Melissa Huckabee. Police sent the letter in for forensic testing, noting the abundance of misspelled words and erratic handwriting. Police searched the area mentioned in the letter until finally, 10 days after Sandra disappeared, on April 6, 2009, Local farmers made a grim discovery when draining an irrigation pond. They reported a black suitcase with a strong odor in the pond just north of the trailer park. Detectives rushed to the scene and inside the tied up suitcase, they found the body of a young girl in the fetal position wearing a Hello Kitty shirt. Later, a medical examiner confirmed using dental records what everyone already suspected, that the victim was Sandra Cantu. 
The little girl had abrasions on her left elbow and lower lip, and experts also found an anti-anxiety medication in her system that Sandra had not been prescribed. Based on findings that suggested she'd been strangled with a shred of cloth fashioned into a noose, her cause of death was listed as homicidal asphyxiation. In an instant, the search for a missing child transformed into a hunt for a ruthless killer. While the FBI released a suspect profile of a white male between 20 and 40 years old with a history of violence against children, detectives were still suspicious of the woman who seemed to be continuously inserting herself into the investigation, Melissa Huckabee. Police went to Melissa's home to ask a few questions, and she asserted that she had been decorating her classroom at the local church during the time Sandra went missing. She also told them that she made a phone call around four that afternoon regarding her stolen suitcase. The officer asked Melissa why someone would take Sandra, to which she replied, Why do people hurt other people? Because they're sick in the head. Disgusting. Melissa also said to detectives, I don't know if you know this, but Sandra was my daughter's best friend, and explained that Sandra would often visit her home 10 to 15 times each day. Sandra was my daughter's best friend. She came over here almost every day and stayed with my daughter. Police obtained her cell phone records, which verified that she'd made a call at that time, but they still weren't sure when exactly Sandra disappeared and needed to gather evidence. So they locked down the church where Melissa worked, searched her mobile home, and combed through her car for clues. Inside her car, investigators found a post-it note containing scribbles of the exact address of where Sandra's body was dumped. They also located a notebook in her home with the same paper as the letter she had given the police at the vigil. Oh, but the real nail in the coffin was that she left impressions of the letter on a different page, proving she had written the letter in that notebook. It's possible that Melissa wrote that letter and caused the scene at Sandra's vigil because she enjoyed the attention. Detectives uncovered a metal rolling pin often used to make bread for the Lord's Supper with a suspicious blood-like smear and a bent handle in the church. DNA tests would confirm the reddish-brown smudge to be Sandra's blood. Moreover, one of the blinds in the church was missing a cord matching the one used to tie the suitcase. As evidence mounted against her, the pressure became too much for Melissa, and she attempted to take her own life. Investigators had to wait until the hospital released her before another interview, but they asked a few questions over the phone. Fingers were sort of pointing toward your dad and or your grandfather, and you wanted to make something clear, right? That was my suitcase. It was stolen out from in front of my house. So do you believe your missing suitcase was the same suitcase that Sandra was found in? Um, I do not know. The suitcase that I see from what I can see on TV, it does not look like my suitcase. Melissa, making it clear that she has only seen the suitcase Sandra was found in on TV, could be her way of ensuring she doesn't slip up by admitting she knows whether the suitcase was hers or not. By saying it doesn't look like hers, she also may have been attempting to shift suspicion away from herself. Police have not disclosed any information as to whether or not it is my suitcase. I know they are in the process of getting pictures of certain suitcases, my specific suitcase. Then an ex-Marine and his wife who lived nearby informed police that they had seen Melissa at the irrigation pond during the hours of interest in Sandra's disappearance. They described her as distracted and hurried and said she told them that she had just stopped to urinate. Melissa left the hospital a few days later, and when faced with the enormity of the evidence against her, she cracked and told investigators that she had killed Sandra. She insisted that it was all an accident and that they had been playing a game of hide-and-seek when Sandra locked herself in the suitcase. There was no confusion given the evidence that Sandra had been assaulted with the rolling pin. Not to mention, detectives found the same drug that Sandra had in her system in Melissa's purse. Furthermore, a glance at her record showed that she had been accused of allegedly drugging another little girl earlier that year. However, based on a lack of proof, no charges were filed against Melissa. Investigators speculated that she had been practicing her calculated attack at that point. Melissa then confessed that she had put the bag in her car and forgotten about it, and by the time she remembered, Sandra was already dead, and she panicked. This confession may have been an impulsive story Melissa made up in an attempt to get in less trouble. At that point, she likely knew there was too much evidence against her to entirely get away with it, so she needed to say something to try and lessen the charges. Unfortunately for Melissa, her story wasn't adding up. At her trial, Melissa was described as somewhat of a loner who suffered from mental illness. Prosecutors alleged that Melissa had lured Sandra to the church before slipping her the drug and waiting for her to pass out. 
Then she assaulted and strangled the little girl before cramming her body into the suitcase and throwing it into the pond. Although Melissa appears to become emotional at times, it's unclear if this is genuine or if she is faking sadness for attention or to look sympathetic. Although she appears on the verge of tears a couple times, she does not actually cry. It's also possible that the emotion Melissa is feeling is because she got caught, not because of what she did. Melissa pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and kidnapping and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole to avoid the death penalty. She apologized to the Cantu family in court, saying, I still cannot understand why I did what I did. Every day I try to discover my motivation, but I still do not have an answer. This is a question I will struggle with for the rest of my life. When asked about her motive for the crime, one officer stated, Melissa's world was her daughter. Sandra was like the little flower child of the trailer park. Everybody liked her. Melissa's daughter is not like that. I don't know if there's some jealousy going on. Red Flags This case is every parent's worst nightmare because there do not appear to be many warning signs of what Melissa was capable of. However, the alleged prior attempt of drugging another child is one huge red flag in this case. But unfortunately, no one knew about it until after Sandra was attacked. Another red flag is that Melissa kept inserting herself into the case. It's likely that Melissa enjoyed the attention she got by being involved. The moral of this story is that Melissa Huckabee was a cold-hearted monster who robbed the world of a precious little light. Sandra's family can only take solace in the fact that this woman will never be able to do this again. All right, on that note, it's time for our last twisted true crime case. 16-year-old Rebecca Marie Watts, better known as Becky, was a teenage girl living in Bristol, United Kingdom when she seemingly vanished into thin air. While officers initially believed she may have simply run away, secrets hidden in her home revealed that she had actually been murdered in one of the most savage ways possible. On June 3, 1998, Becky was born to Tanya Watts and Darren Galsworthy, who split up shortly after discovering the pregnancy. Therefore, Becky lived separately with her mother, but when she was three years old, the Bristol Safeguarding Children Board decided she would receive better care living with her father. At this point, Darren had married a woman named Angie and settled into a life with her and her son, 12-year-old Nathan Matthews. Still, they welcomed Becky with open arms and the environment with both children seemed to be a great fit as Nathan doted on his new little sister. Despite their nine-year age difference and some typical sibling arguments, the two were said to have formed a strong bond right away. Unfortunately, however, Becky was bullied relentlessly in school with teachers describing her as incredibly shy and quiet. As a result, she developed a severe eating disorder and became anxious when leaving her home. Becky continued to struggle with her mental health, so Angie called the children and young people services for help with managing her stepdaughter's growing anxiety, but they failed to thoroughly investigate her claims. So instead, Becky began meeting with a social worker where she expressed feeling alone and fearful of someday being abducted. She also mentioned that a young male peer had threatened to post nude photos of her on the internet. Following this, Becky was removed from public school and enrolled in a hospital education service, where she seemingly thrived and even made some good friends. She also began dating a fellow high school student named Luke Oberhansley, but unfortunately, things were about to take a grim turn. Sadly, around this time, Angie was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which took a massive toll on the entire family. As a result, tensions were running high and there was more arguing in the household. But her son Nathan and his long-term girlfriend, Shauna Hoare, stepped in to help. After her diagnosis, Shauna actually became a registered caregiver for Angie. This leads us to February 18, 2015. Becky left home to enjoy an evening at the local rugby club before attending a sleepover with some friends. She woke up early the next day and headed back to her house, excited to see her boyfriend in a few hours. Around 11 in the morning, Luke sent her a message indicating he was ready to meet up, to which she replied, Goody XXXX, followed by a final text saying she was jamming out to music. Then, nothing. <coughs> Becky suddenly stopped responding to text messages, phone calls, and social media. At first, her family just assumed she was off with friends or her boyfriend, but they started to get worried when she still hadn't come home the following evening so they contacted the police and reported her missing. 
Angie confirmed that she had briefly spoken with Becky at their home shortly after 11 on the day she went missing, but she was hurrying off to an appointment and didn't gather much from their conversation. Given Becky's age and history of mental health issues, police took her disappearance seriously from the jump. They speculated that she might have taken her own life, so they began large-scale searches of nearby areas, but there was no sign of the teenager anywhere. While searching her bedroom, they realized that her cell phone, tablet, and laptop were all missing. Oddly, though, all of her clothes and money were left behind. Authorities wondered if she had simply run away, but her parents insisted that she wouldn't leave without telling anyone. Then, a few days after she disappeared, her father and grandmother captured the world's attention by making a public plea for her safe return. Following the appeal, hashtag FindBecky started trending on social media. With virtually no leads, detectives started interviewing everyone close to Becky, starting with her family members. Shauna spoke up first and said that while she didn't see Becky, she heard someone go down the stairs that morning, followed by the front door closing, and assumed it was her leaving. Nathan was also at home that day as he and Shauna had been caring for Angie, and he provided the same story to police, that he believed he heard Becky, but never actually saw her that day. So under the impression that Becky was at home just before she vanished, investigators sent in a forensic team to search. They uncovered small bits of blood around the doorframe of Becky's bedroom at varying heights, suggesting that there had been a struggle of some kind. They also discovered a fingerprint and sent all the evidence off for testing. Detectives called in Shauna and Nathan for further questioning. Just a minor thing really, but I think some of our colleagues were trying to speak to Nathan, perceived a bit of reluctance. So, yeah. Do you have any knowledge of that? Not to my knowledge, and I wouldn't know now. No, Nathan had any sort of concerns about speaking to us? Not that he's told me now. No. Okay. If he does, I wouldn't know then. <laughs> During Shauna's interview, there are a few things that raise suspicion. She laughs nervously when answering a lot of the questions, which is inappropriate given she is discussing her boyfriend's sister, whom she knows well. Yeah. How is he finding it? Um, he's found it quite hard, actually. Again, he's kind of more thinking, my God, if it would... Yeah, yeah. Or again, knowing how hard it would be for his mum at the moment. Yeah. You know, because Becky was almost like her daughter, daughter to her. Yeah. And then over the weekend, have, you, have either you and Nathan been involved in searching for Becky or doing any No, I wasn't aware they were doing a search. I didn't realise yeah. until, um, I think it was yesterday, yeah. I went on my Facebook and obviously it, there was news articles and pictures popped up mm. about that they did the search. Mm. Most people would likely be crying or at the very least not feel so lighthearted. She also moves her body away from the detectives, which indicates she wants to create distance for herself. On top of all this, she also refers to Becky in the past tense, despite her still being missing. During his interview, Nathan told investigators that he felt like Becky was rude and often manipulated his parents. While this information came as a surprise to the police, they had no reason to hold the couple and let them go. But that would all change the next day. Test results on the evidence collected at the home showed that the blood belonged to Becky and the fingerprint matched Nathan. Based on what he said in his interview, officers felt they had enough to arrest the couple on suspicion of murder. The pair insisted that they had nothing to do with Becky's disappearance, but back at the house, investigators revved up their search. Their living space was reportedly filthy, with piles of garbage on every surface, but strangely, the tub was sparkling clean. They also located a suspicious receipt from the day after Becky went missing, showing that someone bought a circular saw, goggles, and a face mask. Detectives pulled CCTV footage from the store and saw that Shauna and Nathan had purchased the incriminating items. With all of the evidence stacked against him, Nathan knew the jig was up and finally confessed to something more horrible than anyone ever could have imagined. I know, so I came up with the idea to scare her because, like, to try and... <sighs> she'd leave things out on the floor of my mum to trip over her and obviously would talk to her. Um, I thought if I was, you know, able to scare her and obviously her not be harmed and obviously be released. Obviously when she got back, <coughs> she obviously would have been scared and more appreciative of things as people are. Okay. During this clip, Nathan remained bent over, staring down at the floor. This closed posture could indicate that he has given up. He avoided eye contact, which can be associated with feeling uncomfortable or anxious. So tell me what you thought you were going to do. What your plan was. 
obviously stick them in the suitcase. Obviously put tape around your mouth so she wouldn't make any noise. And then I'm thinking of like a wooded area or whatever. I'll obviously like scare her and you know say um start treating people better, you know not being a self centered. Nathan's repeated use of the word obviously could be his way to try and make his behavior seem more normal than it is. Um, and then like make a threat of, um, you know, or you know, or this could happen again or worse or something like that. And obviously, and then come back and obviously would have acted as normal. So when did you think all of this up? Because obviously she, don't li she won't listen to me about leaving shit on the floor for my mum to trip up. Um, she doesn't listen to her dad about it. Just trying to make, find a way of making her actually listen. He prepared a written confession with his lawyer, reading in part, In my car I had a large bag, a stun device, handcuffs, tape, and a mask. I had developed an idea to scare Rebecca by kidnapping her. I wanted to kidnap her to scare her and teach her a lesson. I believed that she was selfish and her behavior towards my mother was a risk to her health. He claimed to have panicked and strangled Becky in her bedroom when his mask fell off before stuffing her body, along with her cell phone, tablet, and laptop into the large bag. Nathan said he put the bag in the trunk of his car and only took it out later when no one was around to dismember Becky's corpse in the bathtub. An autopsy later revealed that Becky had been cut into eight separate parts and had suffered over 40 injuries, including 19 knife wounds after her death. Nathan then left the body in a guard shed near the flat he shared with Shauna. Finally, he stated, Shauna did not know anything about me causing the death of Rebecca or my attempt to dispose of and hide the body. Had she known, she would have reported me to the police. Nathan was charged with Becky's murder, and shortly after, her remains were located precisely where he said they would be. It was later confirmed that the owners of the garden shed, friends of Shauna and Nathan's, had accepted a promise of 10,000 pounds from Nathan in return for their help and discretion. They were each charged with assisting an offender and served time in prison for their roles, although they denied knowing what was inside the bags. Following Nathan's confession, Shauna continued to tearfully deny any knowledge of what happened to Becky. I can't even look at him. I was sat in the courtroom today and I just wanted to, I say kill him, that's a bad choice of words. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. Shauna has her arms crossed. This position, with her arms hugging her torso, can be self-soothing and a protective position. However, it could also indicate that she is feeling defensive. If this is the first time Shauna is being told that Becky's body was found at her house, then her reaction is somewhat unusual, as she doesn't appear to be surprised and speaks with a lack of emotion. And yeah, I didn't always like Becky, but... She was a nice enough girl. She was so young. And the fact that we've got a little girl ourselves. I'm carrying his unborn children. Shauna breaks down and cries at one point, but this show of emotion appears to be linked to herself and her unborn child rather than to Becky. Investigators felt confident that Shauna was more involved in the situation than she was letting on, but they still had to prove it. During questioning, they gathered that the couple had enjoyed an evening of monopoly and takeout food after the crime. Still, when asked about Shauna's involvement, Nathan adamantly claimed to be the sole perpetrator. It was pretty hard to believe that Nathan had carried out such a gruesome crime without Shauna noticing a thing. Then, cell phone records emerge containing horrifying messages between the pair, including plans to kidnap young girls in the time leading up to Becky's murder. One text from Shauna to Nathan read, Just went to Costcutter and saw a very pretty, petite girl. Almost knocked her out to bring her home, LOL, XOXO. Moreover, it was later learned that the couple had started dating when Nathan was in his early 20s, and Shauna was just 14 years old. Not only could this relationship be illegal, but there's a huge maturity level difference between a 14-year-old and a 20-something-year-old, and it's likely that this imbalance could result in the younger partner being manipulated. Shauna was consequently charged with perverting the course of justice, and after her DNA was discovered in a bag with Becky's remains and inside one of the face masks, she was also charged with murder. 
Shauna and Nathan were also charged with conspiracy to kidnap, preventing the lawful burial of a body, possessing a prohibited weapon, and four unrelated counts of making indecent images of children. At their trial, Nathan alleged that Becky's death was a horrible accident, and while he admitted to the other charges, he denied the murder charge. Shauna denied any involvement whatsoever and referred to the text messages between herself and Nathan as unfortunate and sarcastic. After nearly five weeks, the trial came to a dramatic conclusion, with Nathan being escorted to the courthouse for sentencing in a police convoy. He was ultimately found guilty of murder and Shauna guilty of manslaughter. Additionally, they were both found guilty of all other charges against them. Nathan was handed a minimum term of 33 years behind bars, and Shauna got a sentence of 17 years. Red flags. One red flag in this case is the text that Shauna sent to Nathan about taking a girl from a storm. Even if this was just a joke, as Shauna claimed, it's still extremely concerning to banter about kidnapping. If your partner ever makes comments about abducting someone, consider that a wake-up call, as that is not normal behavior. 